So at any rate, Pam, everybody look at Pam. Everybody look up here and just hey, Pam. Pam. Hi, Hi Pam. Pam. We're recording for you. Thank you. Uh, we'll we'll see you know how good this is. So I wanted to do kind of a general thing today to talk about what Revelation is, uh, what the large picture of Revelation is, and uh, not get too far into uh, some of the details of how one would go about reading this special kind of book. So let me first talk about what kind of special uh, book it is, then I'll get into um, what it's uh, meant to do for us, and uh, we'll just go from there with uh, trying to dispel some of the uh, uh, fears and questions and attitudes uh, about and toward Revelation that have come up particularly in American society uh, over uh, the years, frankly, since colonial times, um, and see if that doesn't help us lay down kind of a, a foundation for the many weeks ahead that, that we'll have in Revelation. I suspect that we will spend um, maybe the better part of a year in, on Wednesday mornings doing Revelation. So, let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that in it we find a revelation of yourself. And that's exactly what we've come here today to look into this last book of the New Testament. It's called The Revelation. We ask that in our time together that you would further reveal yourself to us in this special and hopeful book. We ask this not so that we would have all the answers, but so that you would be glorified in our lives and in the life of your church, especially here at St. John's. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, Revelation. Where do we get that word? Well, uh, it comes uh, from uh, the Greek word that was used to title the book in that collection of letters that I have talked about before with the uh, Roman numerals LXX. Now, this is my famous review times that I always get into. LXX. What does that uh, refer to? Do you remember? LXX is uh, Roman numerals meaning how many? L means what in Roman numerals? 50. And X means what? 10. So 50 plus 10 plus 10. 50, that's 70. Yes, it is 70. And uh, they, they might have called it LXXII, or 72, but they just shortened it down to 70 to refer to uh, the 72 translators that uh, legend, I, I dare not say history, but that legend tells us translated the Torah, the five books of Moses, the law books from the Old Testament, from their Hebrew into Greek for the, uh, the Greek library at Alexandria, Egypt. Now these 72, the reason I say it's a legend is it, it will become apparent as I tell it uh, in short. These 72 translators took 72 days to translate from the Hebrew into the Greek, the five books of Moses. Uh, a little amazing, isn't it? Okay. 72 yeah. translators in 72 days. Well, anyway, at any rate, they call it the 70. Uh, the, the Septuagint is the, the full name for it. But they titled the books that had heretofore not been titled. So, for example, when you read the Old Testament, uh, and it, it didn't say Genesis uh, in the Hebrew. It didn't say Deuteronomy in the Hebrew. It didn't say uh, First Kings in Hebrew. It didn't say, they didn't have titles. They were referred to as those books. So when they translated for the Alexandrian Library, they titled them in the Greek, Genesis. So uh, that's why we get Genesis. And the same thing with the last book of the Bible, uh, Revelation was called Apocalypsis, uh, which means to reveal. That's why we translate it into English as Revelation. But the title of the book was actually in the Greek, Apocalypsis. Or apocalypsis. Now, were they scribes or what were they called? Who? 
the 72 people. That well, that's a legend. They were, they were translators. They weren't translators. Uh, scribes, although there would have been, I'm sure, if such a company really existed, there would have been those who had scribal skills, though they uh, were they scribes um, in, in the technical sense of it. Um, who knows? Who knows? <clears throat> so, uh, when we read this revealing book, um, what is it meant to reveal? It's a very important question. You know, we look at this title, and although the title isn't part of the uh, inspired scripture, uh, it, it, it can give us a good glimpse of what that inspired scripture is about. Tell us what one kind of thing what is coming. Yes. Let's look at the first couple it's verses hard for in the book. Us to understand it won't what be. You're it won't be. I know. As time goes on in our study of Revelation, it will not be so difficult to understand. So this says in verse one of Revelation chapter one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that already becomes, as you say, cookie, difficult to, to understand because the word of there can be understood or even translated two ways. It can be translated the revelation of Jesus Christ as it is here in the English Standard Version and really in most of our uh, English translations. Uh, what version do you have there, Norma? Oh, Revised Standard. Re New Revised Standard? Yep. And what does it say? New Revised. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Of. Right. Now, it could also be translated the revelation about Jesus Christ. Okay, so either one of those is an acceptable translation. Uh, most uh, English translations go with the of because it does come from him. Uh, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ in that sense. But I never want us to lose track of what this book is about. It is a revealing of Jesus Christ. So it is a revelation about Jesus Christ as well, okay? So we want to uh, bear that in mind at all times. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him, which God gave Jesus Christ, to show to his servants. Now, uh, what's the word there in the New Revised? Is it servants? Let me see. Understanding, mm -hmm. testimony, mm -hmm. Servants, is that what you say, Norma? Mm -hmm. Okay, you both have the same one. Yeah. So, um, the... the I want us to kind of think in terms of what the biblical language says. Uh, it pluralizes the, the Greek word doulos, which means slaves or servants. Uh, <laughs> so you could translate it that way if you, if you uh, wanted to, which, uh, which God gave Jesus to show his slaves the things which must soon take place. This is the same word that's used in John 15 when Jesus talks to his disciples. And he says, I no longer call you doulos. Uh, so I no longer call you slaves or I no longer call you servants. We try to clean it up a little bit and for our uh, cultural context. The word slaves disturbs us too much to use that, so we use servants. We don't even like the word servants. Oh, do you have servants in your home? We would never even ask anybody that question because it would be it would it, we, we all need one. Uh, it's culturally inappropriate. We don't even like that. But Jesus said in John 15, around verses 15, 16, 17, he said, "I no longer call you servants." What does he call us? Disciples. No. In, in John 15, oh, what does he call us? Yeah. Nothing. What does he call his, his disciples now? Instead of servants or slaves, he calls us friends. Friends. Uh, I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friends. It would be helpful for us to just turn to John 15 and, and uh, see exactly uh, how he puts that, because it would be helpful for us in Revelation. At verse... Let's start at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's the context that he sets. That's verse 15, or chapter 15. Then he goes on from that 
foundational uh, statement in those two verses. In verse 14 of chapter 15 of John, he says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now we're going to find out right. today that this uh, has uh, no uncertain bedrock in Revelation 2, which shouldn't surprise us because... Uh, it's the same John, the Apostle John, who writes the Gospel and writes Revelation. Now, I should say for those who might someday view this videotape that there is all manner of debate about whether John, the Apostle, wrote Revelation. In fact, there are some who would contest whether he even wrote the Gospel. I make no such uh, qualification. I'm going to tell you that uh, based upon the kind of imagery that's used in each. The language is different because it's a different style of literature. And that's, I think, what throws off uh, many commentators uh, today, theologians. At the but, very beginning of Revelations up here, it says in my book that um, four times the author identifies himself as John, and John was held to be the author from the second century. Whether or not this was the same John as one who the gospel cannot be determined. Right. And, and Luther deals with that, too. If you have your uh, Lutheran study Bible at home, I noticed that neither one of you have it here today, and I understand why. In case any publisher from Concordia uh, is watching this at some point, uh, the reason is because the book is too blasted heavy to carry from home to Bible study. So um, we need to put a bookshelf here where you can uh, put But I'd rather you studied it at home. But in that uh, very helpful Lutheran study Bible that Concordia publishes, there are some words from uh, Luther at the, at the beginning. And I'm going to try to find it here. This is uh, Luther on Revelation, and it's on page 2195, which underscores the idea that that book, book is heavy. It's got thousands of pages in it. Uh, Luther says... Uh, That, that we're not sure about, uh, you know, what John it is who, who wrote the book, um, but that it doesn't really um, make a lot of difference. Um, We have let the book alone until now, especially because some of the ancient fathers held that it was not the work of St. John the Apostles, as is stated in the ecclesiastical history. For our part, we still share this doubt. So Luther doubted whether it was written by John the Apostle. By that, however, no one should be prevented from regarding this as the work of St. John the Apostle, or of whomever else he chooses to have written. So what's important? Who wrote it or what it says? What it says. Yes, what's important is what it says. So back to John 15 and verse 15, it says, No longer do I call you servants or uh, doulas, uh, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I heard from my father I have made, made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. These are similar kinds of inroads uh, that will be made in the book of Revelation. Uh, one of the other things that it says at the beginning of the uh, Lutheran Study Bible is that this prophetic book, it is indeed a prophetic book, and there are many kinds of prophecy. Um, this is a kind of different kind of prophecy where it paints a picture uh, by which we can ascertain uh, what is being prophesied. Now, it's challenging. You're right, Cookie. You, uh, when you say, we don't know uh, what it's hard to understand, well, it's, it's challenging, but we can come to an understanding. And one of the things that it says in the preface to this book in the Lutheran Study Bible is that it not merely uh, presents the stormy future of suffering that will afflict not only the church, but the whole earth. Not only the slaves, or the servants, or the friends, or the followers of Everybody. Jesus Christ, but which will afflict the entire earth. But it also presents a message of hope. 
And we're going to find out that that message is stronger than the stormy message when we start to understand how the book is to be, to be read. Um, Luther says that we can profit by this book and make good use of it, first of all, for our comfort, but second of all, for our warning. Now, it's no surprise that Luther would find these two things uh, in any book of the Bible, uh, particularly in the New Testament, that there should be words of warning as well as words of comfort because Luther was so big on law and gospel, which is what we're studying on Wednesday evenings. If you come back at 7 o'clock in the evening, we're watching these Andy Griffith episodes and listening to Joyce Henry uh, laugh and laugh and laugh. Mm -hmm. She just gets so tickled watching those episodes. But the reason that we're watching these Andy Griffith episodes, these old black and white ones, is because they're so good at depicting... Uh, what Luther saw in the New Testament, both law, as depicted by Barney in the Andy yeah. Griffith episodes, and gospel, as depicted by uh, the message of grace and, and gospel that we, we see in uh, the words of Jesus and the teaching of the apostles. So both of these things must be there, and Revelation is a wonderful book to find both law and gospel, and we must be very careful as we read it that we understand which is actually which. So I've printed out some handouts here for you today. Uh, those of you that watch on video, um, I have a few left, and if you're really nice to me, I'll make sure that you get one. Okay. This is kind of the uh, nice. this is kind of the introduction to Revelation that I want to do today. It's the seven beatitudes of Re Revelation. Now, what does the word beatitude mean? I was reading them last night, but they didn't. Yeah, there are Beatitudes in, in what other book of the New Testament? Matthew? Yes, yeah, Matthew 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, also, we'll find uh, Beatitudes or Blessed Ars in other yeah. places. Um, so, if, uh, uh, if I said that you had a beatific smile, do you know what that means? Beatific? Beautiful. So, same... Uh, same root word as beatitude. Well, Beautiful. you could have a beatific... There, there, we smile for many reasons, don't we? Mm -hmm. What are some examples of times if, if something is, is funny? So let me give you an example of what is not a beatific smile and an example of what is a beatific smile with the same illustration. This was a joke that was told to me at the bowling alley uh, two Tuesdays ago by Jimmy Dunn. Uh, he, uh, he now uh, loves to come up to me uh, each week and, and tell me uh, a new joke. And I love to see if I've got one in my repertoire that is thematically similar enough that I can tell him back. Because I love to hear Jimmy laugh. He's got a great laugh. It shakes his whole body. So he told me uh, to get things started two Tuesdays ago about the little girl who uh, was at church one Sunday morning and she met her pastor uh, at the front door of the church, you know, where he stood shaking hands and greeting people. And she said, Pastor, I decided this morning that when I grow up, I'm going to get the best paying job I can possibly get, and I'm going to give half the money to you. <laughs> and he said, well, that is the sweetest thing I think I've heard in a long, long time. He said, what made you uh, come to such a uh, decision? She said, well, because on the way over here, driving over here to church this morning, my daddy said that you're the poorest pastor that we've ever had. <laughs> now, you are right now are not smiling beatifically. You are smiling because you are amused. Okay? Now, the pastor that that little girl said it to, if he smiled at her response, he would not be smiling in amusement. Okay? But he might be smiling beatifically. What I mean by that is that if you can still smile in adversity, you have a beatific smile. You're not smiling because you are amused at the situation in which you find yourself. You are smiling in spite of that situation. And that is a beatific smile. It is the, the smile knowing that you are blessed despite your circumstances. Now sometimes we smile because of how we feel, as you just did when you laughed at Jimmy's joke at my expense. 
Okay? So We didn't know that he was talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you to say so, and I'm blessed that you do. Um, but, uh, but I smiled beatifically, because even though the joke was on me, I know I'm blessed. You with me? Yeah. That is a beatific smile. That is a smile that comes out of the beatitude, out of the blessing, out of the blessed are you statement. So let's look at some of those in, in uh, keeping your finger in Revelation 1, of course. Let's turn back to Matthew 5, the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. You know there's also a Sermon on the Plain, right? And I'm not talking about... Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about Southwest Airlines here. Matthew 5. Why is there, just as an aside, why is there a Sermon on the Mount and a Sermon on the Plain? They're, they're slightly different. Right. I want to know. Okay, I thought you would. Because certainly you don't think that Jesus took his core teaching that you can find in this Sermon on the Mount. You don't think he only gave it to this one group of people, do you? I'm sure he did. Well, he did it here on a mountain, on a mount or a, or a hilltop. But somewhere else, where it was actually on a plain, more not, not on a mountaintop, um, he gave it to another group of people. And if he's given it, is it did he memorize it? Did, 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 he, did he memorize all of his sermons? And, no, no, and, no, no, no. No, not only that, but it may even be uh, a collection uh, of sermons that, that he, uh, or a collection of, of uh, a, a distillation. Of, of his teachings that uh, he thought were especially important for people to have. So one he gave in one place, one he gave in another place, and it uh, came out or was recorded at very least uh, slightly differently. So here we find at Matthew 5, verse 2, the Beatitudes. And Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now they're not smiling here beatifically. <laughs> right? right. Now you're, you, if you're in a poor situation, you're not going, <laughs> man, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> We're just, oh, my was. spirit is just, uh, I got nothing left. I got, no, I'm poor in spirit. Huh? I'm so amused by that. No, we would never do that. But we're blessed anyway. We can still smile with happiness. Because really, that's kind of the idea that's in this word blessed it is that you're not smiling because uh, you're feeling good. You're smiling because you're still happy. You're, you have a deep abiding joy. So you can smile in the tough times of life because you are blessed. So it says here, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because despite how we feel about our situation in life, Ours is the kingdom of heaven. You see? It's a beatific smile that we have. We radiate with the knowledge of what we truly have. And we'll find in Revelation that it's a very similar kind of teaching that's given in the letters to the churches that we're not going to get to today. But uh, in the teaching it says, um, I know you think you are poor, but you are really rich. Sounds very much like this, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, blessed are those who mourn. Well, I don't feel like laughing and stuff when it, uh, I can remember a, a joke that uh, Susan's cousin told one time, which I'm not going to repeat here, uh, but he said that on the evening uh, of the visitation of, of Susan's daddy, uh, a, a much-loved man and greatly revered in the community. I mean, it took hours uh, and hours. They, they were, I think they were open almost two hours after uh, visitation was supposed wow. to be over because of the outpouring from the community. And we all went back to uh, Susan's mom's house and we were just exhausted. And her cousin Dick came over and he told this joke just to lighten the mood. Mm -hmm. you know? And Susan's mom never understood a single joke. She never got she just never got jokes, but she loved to laugh and would even do so in that situation when we were mourning uh, the death of her husband. 
Um, she laughed anyway, just because she loved to laugh. Well, the next day, the, uh, the presiding uh, pastor at St. Paul United Methodist Church, where I used to be the pastor, uh, but uh, uh, Pastor uh, Joanne had, had, had done the service that day. She was the current pastor of his church. And when she came to uh, the, uh, the reception after the, uh, the funeral service at the Allender home, at Susan's family home, um, Susan's mom, Mary, called me down the hallway when Pastor Joanne came in the back door, and uh, she expected that one pastor would take care of another pastor, which I was fine with, but she said, tell Reverend Joanne the joke Dick told last night. <laughs> well, it was not a suitable joke, <laughs> proving that Susan's mom didn't understand jokes, yeah. didn't get them. <laughs> it was not a suitable joke to, uh, to tell to, uh, to this female pastor. And, or, or maybe even to any pastor. Um, and uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, Dick, if you're watching this video in heaven, should you have really told this pastor that joke? Um, so, so I said, well, I really don't feel that this is an appropriate time to be telling you jokes, Joanne, so I'll just forego the joke, but I'll introduce you to some of the folks around, so took her through that. Well, uh, but inside I was smiling with a beatific smile because even in the midst of that situation I could still smile. But it is difficult to smile when you're mourning. And yet it says here, blessed. This is a beatitude. You're still blessed when you mourn because you will find comfort. And you do. Blessed are the meek. Well, what's, what's so... What's, you know, a big deal right now is about bullying in our culture, isn't it? Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's so much bullying going on that even the bullies are bullied. Well, bullies have always been bullied, and bullies have always bullied. When I was a little boy, there were bullies. When my dad was a little bully, I mean, I remember him telling stories about being bullied, to which he told me, when you get bullied, you know, son, when you go off to elementary school, I know what's going to happen. It's always happened. And when somebody punches you, he said, you do this right here, and you hit him square in the nose. He said, and I'll deal with the teachers and the principal. You don't worry about that. You don't let anybody bully you. Well, is that what Jesus is teaching here? What Jesus says is, blessed, happy, joyous are the meek. Why? Because they will inherit the earth. <laughs> Nice. Well, we don't need to keep going through these Beatitudes, but let's go through some of the Beatitudes that are in Revelation. And there are seven Beatitudes in Revelation from chapter 1, the first chapter, through chapter 22, the very last chapter of the book. And so that you don't have to flip all around, I've got this handy-dandy list of them here for you. And you'll get some more uh, handouts as we go along. So as per usual, if you want to get yourself a little notebook to keep all of these in, uh, you'll find it helpful as we go along. Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 3, my favorite beatitude in here. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So what do you think John's purpose was, in part at any rate, in writing this revelation? Why did he write this lengthy 22-chapter long letter <coughs> To the churches. Did he intend for them to hide it? No, no. What? To keep what is written in it. Well, but, but before that, it. yes, he wants you to read it. Read it. And how read does he want it read? Wow. So where might you imagine he expects this letter to be read? If it's going to be read and heard by others, where would the letter be read? Churches. In the church, yes, absolutely. This, I think, was a letter that was originally intended by its author to be read in the church. Was it considered a church at that time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, he, uh, I mean, he, it, by the time we get into the second and third chapters, we find that uh, there are miniature letters within this bigger letter called Revelation to seven specific churches. Yeah. 
So uh, you want to be uh, one step ahead of the, the people uh, when we get to chapter two, and uh, when we, uh, you, you don't want to? Oh, that's okay. fine. <laughs> or, uh, unless they've read, unless they've watched the, the video. Okay. So uh, write on the back of your paper the word, you know when trappers would go out and they'd trap beaver or whatever, and what would they end up with after they skinned the beavers? They skinned the fur. Uh, what, what did you call those hides? But they would take them to market and sell their wares. No. Pelts. <laughs> now don't write it yet. Don't write it yet. I want you to write the word uh, pelts. Don't write it yet. That's spelled P-E-L-T-S. Don't write it yet. But as you write it, I want the first and the last letters to be capital letters. So a capital P and a capital S, but the ones in the middle to be little letters. Okay? So it'll be written like this. Okay, now this is not the order in which they're named in Revelation, but it's a helpful way to remember the seven churches. You ready? They're capitalized because there are two churches that start with P and there are two churches that start with S. There's only one for the E, L, and the T. All right? So uh, in, for the P, you've got Pergamum. P-E-R-G-A-M-U. Mm -hmm. And you've got Philadelphia. One, two. Then for the E, you've got Ephesus. Same city that what book of the Bible, what letter in the New Testament is written to? The book of Ephesians. L is to that church uh, that uh, was neither cold nor hot, but was so lukewarm that you just wanted to spit it out of your mouth. Laodicea, L-A-O, D-I-C-E-A. -E mm -hmm. And the T is easy to remember because my old friend uh, Nancy Shaw used to say like this, visually, she'd go, Thyatira. <laughs> so, Thyatira is spelled T-H-Y. I'm looking at it right there. Spell it for us. You're looking at it right there. T-H-Y-A-T-I-R-A, right? Right. Okay. Did you get that, Norma? No. Okay. T-H-Y-A. T-I-R-A. And then the S, there's two of those. One is Smyrna. S-M-Y-R-N-A. S-M-Y-R-N-A. And the next one is Sardis. S-A-R-D-I-S. Okay? So you can remember those by kind of familiarizing yourself with the names of the city, but you can kind of go through them by... The two P's, the one E, L, T, and the two S's, okay? So it's one way to help you memorize those cities because we're going to be talking about them a lot. So, there were, Norma, as that shows us right there, there were seven churches in this area of uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, this is where those uh, seven churches were, just off the coast of the uh, Aegean Sea, the, uh, the eastern coast of the Aegean Sea. So blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear. But not only hear, but keep what is written in them. Now, th th this almost goes without saying that if you hear it, you're going to keep it or obey it. Why? Because as I've taught you before, going all the way back to the great Shema of, of uh, the Jewish people, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says, Hear, O Israel. And that word hear, Shema, that word implies that you not only hear it, but you obey it. Yeah. Okay? So we're going to find that Shema idea in Revelation a lot. 
It's, it's going to say in those letters that I was just talking about to those seven churches, it's, set, it's going to say, those who have ears, let them hear. Yeah. And in that is implied, I think, the idea of if you have ears to hear, keep what you're hearing or obey what you're hearing. Okay. So that's the first beatitude of Revelation. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it because the time is near. That's one of the warnings and one of the comforts of the book, that the suffering is to be short-lived. You know, there are things that are going to be happening, and some of them aren't going to be so nice. There's going to be a lot of suffering. But the time is limited for that suffering, and we're going to find out time after time uh, how it's limited, that it's limited, and what the numbers are that are used to describe the limitations. All right. So, since it's such a blessing, let's do read. Norma, I'm going to ask you to read verse 1, and uh, I'll read verse 2, and Cookie, you'll read verse 3 of Revelation chapter 1. And I want you to read it loudly enough that you're certain that that video camera picks up the sound. Okay. okay? <laughs> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place, he made it be known by sending his angel to his servant, John. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even of all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Thank you. Blessed are you, because you both read it aloud and heard it. All right. Well, why are you blessed, even just with the reading of these three verses? Well, it means, you know, the reading of the entire book. Now, we just went through a, a time in the church uh, where we had, uh, I think, seven uh, epistle lessons or seven New Testament lessons from Revelation. And I tried to touch on them each Sunday that they came up. But in those seven lessons, we did not read aloud in the church the entire 22 chapters. Yeah. Okay, So we're going to try to do that in the course of our time together. We're going to try to read aloud and hear and hopefully obey every single verse of the 22 chapters. All right. So let's look at what we've read so far. Because I want to see if I can pull up a, a beatific smile uh, again from you. In verse 1, the second sentence that Norma read, he made it known by sending his what? Angel. His angel, angel. Uh, to his servant John. Now, that's a, it's a curious word in the New Testament. Um, in fact, it's just a Greek word that we've turned into an English word, very much like we've turned uh, baptizo into baptize in, in, in English. Uh, we didn't really have a corresponding word that works. I've explained that to you before. Yeah. And we really don't in, um, in English. I mean, there are words that you can translate it exactly, but it doesn't really do justice to what it means in the biblical language. So here the word is angelos. If you saw it uh, written out, you would uh, maybe say it angelos. So we just drop the... Uh, the ending of that word which describes whether it's singular or plural or whether it's masculine or feminine or neuter and we just end up with the word angel or we would say angel because of that Italian influence on our language. So angel, what is it? Well, it's an angelos. Well, what's an angelos? An angelos is very simply a messenger. That's what it means. So if you translated this literally, you would say uh, which God gave Jesus to show his servants the things which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his messenger to his servant John. Well, who are the messengers of God? Angels. Yeah, these angelic beings. But I want, I want you to know that later on, when it starts writing to uh, the churches, for example, at, at chapter 2, at the uh, first verse, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write. What does that mean? That every church has its own uh, angelic messenger? Well, 
I don't know. I don't know, but it's kind of a, a nice thought, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and if you believe that that's so, you might want to try to determine who is that angel. Probably our pastor. Well, why would you say that? Because you are the ones who are leading us. Well, the messenger, teaching right? Us, yes, right. I'm the, I'm the messenger right. exactly of God's word right. to the church. Yes. So don't you find that, uh, that it's somewhat of a comfort to know that your pastor is an angel? angel. Isn't that nice? Now, that's a beatific smile. Right? <laughs> yeah. I hope you're not just amused at the notion that I'm an that angel. Much amusing. <laughs> no, really, you are. You're a messenger. Yeah, you can. You can you can be angels to other people. I'll yeah, give you a yeah, I would say, well, I'm not an angel, but yet you can you can really refer to people like that. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a good example of how you can do exactly what you're saying, Norma. Um, when Susan, I think maybe I've told you this story before, or maybe I told it to the Wednesday evening group, but it does you good to repeat something. When Susan was a freshman at Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio, um, she, um, as freshmen, sometimes all freshmen get caught in this uh, thing. Uh, all of a sudden, you're in a situation where you don't know anybody. You know? Yeah. And so yeah. she's, she's kind of wandering uh, about, um, looking for somebody that she does know, or looking for somebody that she can talk to. And um, on the wall surrounding the student union, there was a little sitting ledge that they built all the way around the union. It was just called the wall. So almost anybody in town, if you referred to the wall at Wittenberg, they'd know what you were talking about. And sitting on the wall was only one person. Susan? No. no. Susan's approaching, and there's this one guy uh, sitting there, and he speaks to her. And she comes over, and she sits down on the wall next to him, and he's talking to her. And uh, he brings to her a message of hope and comfort from Jesus Christ. This guy that's just sitting there. Uh, not a student doesn't explain who he is or what he's doing there, and he just tells her that everything's going to be okay. Wow. That God is with her, that Jesus is always with her, even when she feels alone, that God is always with her. And at that point, I think the story goes that Susan told me so long ago that somebody that she did know walked up, and when she turned to talk to this person and then turned back around, the guy is gone. So she tells me later that day, I met an angel. angel today. I met an angel. And he had a word from God for me. Uh, so wow. years go by. okay, And we go to, uh, I believe it was called Southside Community Church. It was a Mennonite church. And uh, we went there uh, one evening uh, for a kind of gathering of many churches in the community. And Susan and I and some others from our church went there. And uh, out steps this guy to greet everyone. And Susan goes, ah, it's my angel. He was the pastor of that church. He just happened to be on the wall of Wittenberg. So you're right. Sometimes, through the message that we bring, we can be angels of God. Now, not in that sense of those winged angels right, like right. cherubim and seraphim, but we can be messengers God of God. We can all be messengers right. sent by God. It's our need when she all, came up. Right. Exactly. God had all the angels, so when we needed somebody, he sent you. Yeah, there you go. Like so, um, how nice and how comforting to hear that. Yes. Thank you. So, not only are you blessed or blessed, when you hear the words of the prophecy, but when you, not only when you read it, but when you hear it too. Now, that's a curious statement to make about a letter in the Bible that most people just avoid because it's so scary. Okay? Blessed are you when you read and hear the words of this book. Well, don't you want to be blessed? Then why do you avoid the book? See? You shouldn't avoid the book, and I'm glad you're not. Because in it, you will find blessing. Blessing, despite the struggle that it depicts, will fall upon you in this life. And you're blessed not only by the hearing and by the keeping of it, but by the knowledge that the time is near. The time for what? Well, yeah, that's we're going we're gonna to find out that there are two things that are going to be near. There's going to be... Um, 
a, a time of struggling, tremendous struggle for the church and the world, and that that time is near, but we'll also find out that there is a time for that beatific attitude that we can have about ourselves, knowing that we're blessed, because that's also near in time and to us, even in the midst of the struggle. And we're going to find uh, depicted here images of lots and lots and lots of specific kinds of struggles that are very frightening, but in the midst of those, we are blessed because we know the outcome in this book. All right? We're, we're going to get... See so you with me so far? Okay, that's the first beatitude. The second beatitude jumps all the way ahead to chapter 14, Revelation 14, 13, and you've got it right here, so you don't even need to flip to it. And it says, and I, now this is John talking, or the author of the book who, who um, determines that he is John. Yes? Can you just say John? Yes. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. I always love to, to hear that, write this. You know, if... If uh, I've, I've, I've described to you what they had to go through to write things in those days, right? Yes. Especially 22 chapters of stuff. Yes. That's a lot of writing, which is going to take a lot of paper or skin to write it on. In fact, you're going to have to take your writing instrument and you're going to have to sharpen it many times to be able to write, or you're going to have to make brand new writing instruments all the time. So, for example, I have a couple of fountain pens upstairs. Uh, none of them are working at the moment. I've got to do some repairs to them because I've let them dry out. Why have I let them dry out? Because it's too difficult to write with them. Because they run out of ink so quickly and you've got to keep refilling them. You know? So, so what I do instead, I carry these handy dandy ballpoint pens like you do too. You don't carry fountain pens anymore. But a, a, uh, a dip pen, whether it was made with a reed or a, uh, a swan feather or something like that, a quill, would have been even more difficult to use. So if you're going to write this, as it says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. If you're going to write something down, it's not going to be a shopping list. You're going to remember a shopping list. Okay? Which it was easy to do in that day because you didn't have to buy enough to fill a refrigerator because they didn't have it. You only bought enough for today. So you knew what you are going for. If you're going to write something down, it was tremendously important. So if a voice from heaven says, write this, we you know for a fountain pen or a <laughs> you know that it's incredibly important. Okay? So write this. Blessed are the dead. Come on! Now that sounds a lot like blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted from the Beatitudes, right? Bye. But this says not just those who mourn now, John's stepping it up a little bit. Blessed are the dead. Ooh, wow! Now I'm telling you, if you can smile beatifically when you're dead and gone, you have really pulled something off or somebody has pulled it off for you. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Why? Why are you dead if you die in the Lord? Well, I mean, why are you blessed if you die in the Lord? Because you're still alive. That's right, because you're still alive. See, this is the, this is the beauty of knowing this. That's where this, the smile so that you, comes That's from. right. That's where the smile comes from, the beatific smile. Right. Because while you're dying, you might be grimacing. Let me tell you another story. Uh, this is a story about an old friend of mine from my last church who died many years ago. Her name was Merle, M-Y-R-L-L. -L. I had more O's in that church. I had uh, Adele's. And Marcel's and Murrell's, and I had some other L's that I can't come up with because that's not important right now. I'm not going to think about it. But Merle, when she was dying, I was called up to uh, the hospital at uh, uh, University of Chapel Hill, and there her whole family was uh, gathered around her when I got there. And we just waited and we, uh, uh, we hoped she, she was dying of, of cancer and it had been very painful it was in, her, in her gut, and she was just. You could see, I mean, the, the distension and the, even through the, the sheets you could, you could see. And despite that pain, at one point when we were gathered around her and she had not been aware of our presence, she had not responded to anybody's words or touch, nothing. But at one point I, 
I said, let's pray for Merle. And the people who were closest took Merle's hands. There was no response. None at all. When they took their hands, there was no response. The rest of us joined hands around. And I prayed for Merle, and I prayed for the family, and I prayed uh, a prayer of knowledge that this saint of God would soon be in the embrace of her Lord. And we all said amen, as we do in situations like that at the end. And we dropped our hands, and they let go of Merle's hands. And as they did, this woman, who had been lying there for hours and hours and hours, I mean into days, in pain and, and somewhere between a grimace of pain, which involuntarily comes upon a face, or just expressionless, hadn't opened her eyes for the longest time didn't say a word, and hadn't moved, just laid there, only, you know, shudders of, of pain, all of a sudden sat up in bed, and as she sat up, she smiled, and her eyes opened slightly, and she reached out uh -huh. like this, yeah. Yeah. and then laid right back down, and about an hour later, she had passed on. We saw my mother do that. Now, I'm telling you, when you... <laughs> When you see something like that, or even when you hear stories about things like that, when you know they're true, you can understand Revelation 14, 13. And you can understand why it's so important to write it down. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And then the Spirit says, this isn't, this isn't Jesus saying it now. Notice, says the Spirit. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. Now, how does the Spirit speak to you? The Word says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirits. Okay? So maybe, maybe John is hearing inside of himself this affirmation of what Jesus is saying. That's the Spirit's job, is to remind us of what Jesus has taught and to affirm the, the, the teachings that he's given. So the Spirit says, perhaps within John, blessed indeed. <laughs> so when I read to you, I want you to listen for the Spirit. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you what I've just read twice already. And I want you to listen to what the Spirit says to your spirit. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. The Spirit says within us, blessed indeed that they may rest from their labors. The struggle is over. Your deeds now follow you. If they follow you, does this mean somehow uh, that, that uh, they're following you up to heaven and now God's going to look at your deeds and say, oh, you did good so you can come in. No, your deeds are in the past. They follow you. It's over. The struggle is over. The victory is won. And the victory is in the Lord in whom you have died. But it has something else to say, too, to us, I think. When we are baptized into Christ, what is it specifically that we're baptized into? Come on, Lutherans. When I say, when I say uh, remember your baptism, or you hear somebody say that, what is it that you're remembering? You're remembering that you are dead. The hymn goes... We are dead, we are dead. See? Right. <laughs> Why would you sing about such a thing unless you understood it as a beatitude? It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? into his death. Blessed are those dead who die in the Lord from now on. This is a baptismal statement as well. This doesn't just have to do with the end of physical life on this earth. This is also a baptismal statement. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. When you die in the Lord, what has happened to you? You have been baptized by God. Right. All right? So now, you're blessed indeed 
you may rest from your labors because your deeds are in the past. Your deeds of righteousness, Lutheran Christians, are a thing of the past. Does that mean that you shouldn't have deeds of righteousness? No, absolutely not. You should. You should want to do good works for the Lord. But, this is an important but, you are not saved from them. You will not wake into eternity because of your good works. You will wake into eternity because of the good work of Christ for you that you were baptized into so that now your flesh is dead forevermore. Now you're alive in the Spirit. You with me? Mm -hmm. That is a beatitude. If you understand that, you are blessed indeed because there will be times in your life where you will think because that wily serpent will say to you, you call those good works? Oh, stink. You better do something better than that if you expect to go to heaven and you can shake your finger right back at that liar and say, wrong, 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 because there is a greater work than all the works that I shall ever do or possibly could do. And that is the work of the cross that I embraced but had nothing to do with accomplishing. Right. Wow. There is a name which is greater than all of your accusations and that name is Jesus. Blessed are you if you hold to that name. Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. If he's coming like a thief, are you going to be gone from home? <laughs> no. Oh. Uh, Jay Gimble, Wherever uh, you're at. Jay Gimble installed, uh, before we ever moved into 620 West Kibbit Street, Jay Gimble installed CPI security. He works with, for CPI. He had our, I met Jay uh, through uh, him, in, uh, not installing, but uh, fixing an install uh, at our house in Graham. And so when uh, we came over here on the very first Sunday of last year that we were here, uh, May 6th, if I remember right, guess who was present? Jay and his wife Christy and their children Alyssa and Nick, they were there for my... I didn't know that they lived in Randleman. I just knew that he worked for CPI. But they had started uh, listening to my sermons on the Graham Friends website uh, for many, many months. And then they found an announcement on the website that I was being called as the new pastor at St. John's in Ashboro. And so they determined they were going to start coming to church here now. That's, no, that's how, great. That's how they started. Yes, it's great. That's how they became members of this church and have become so involved in the church is because of a security system. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. This is all tied into this third beatitude in Revelation. So he installed that, that service. Now, one of the cool things between Graham and Ashboro is that right here on my smartphone or even on my tablet or my computer, I can click my little CPI app and tell it or I can check the security of my house right now. I can look and I can see, uh, has Susan armed the system? That would mean that she's left and come to St. John's to work in the office as the secretary. If it doesn't, that means she forgot to. And I can actually arm it from my phone. Okay? So, um, if, if the security system's not working, what am I going to do? You're going to march her. That's her. That's what yeah. I was just talking about. <laughs> so, uh, if the security system is not working, what am I going to do? Am I going to leave home without arming it? No. Because a thief might come. When the previous tenants of that house were leaving, uh, they were carrying stuff out to their two vehicles from the house. They carried some stuff out. They went right back in, got some stuff, carried it right back out. And when they came back out, they found out that the stuff they'd loaded had already been stolen just in the few moments that they had been out there. Their golf clubs and other things had been stolen. So I got CPI security. Am I not going to use it? Of course I'm going to use it. We're getting ready to go to Ohio for a family reunion. Uh, will the house be alarmed? Yes. <laughs> you bet your ID that it will be alarmed. Well, because, it. behold, they're always coming like thieves. But this is talking about Jesus. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. Well, why do you want to stay awake? Because thieves like to break in yeah. in the middle yeah. of the night or when somebody's not home or aware. Yeah. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Uh, well, you know, uh, we, have, we have new neighbors uh, next door to the house, and it, and it used to be uh, that I didn't have to be too terribly concerned about, you know, I was dressed or whatever. Now, I'm not suggesting I, I walk around in the house naked. That's not what I'm talking about. But I, I, now I've got to be more concerned. 
You know, when I walk out into that one area there and the blinds are open, I, you know, yeah. you've got to be concerned. Yeah. So, uh, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on. Now, what's the point of that? That you not be seen mm -hmm. naked? Well, that's part of it, but so that, so that you're ready to, to go. You know, so that you're ready to respond to the thief. Um, and be seen exposed. Now, what is it that we are to, what kind of garments are we to be clothed in? Christians, I've given you this uh, this talk a couple of times in very recent weeks. How is it that we're to be clothed? What garment are we to be clothed in? Clothed. That's right. We're to be clothed in Christ. We are to we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ is what the apostle teaches us. So blessed are you if you have the garment of Christ on when the thief comes. See? You are exposed if you are clothed in your own self. Why? Because your own self is dead in baptism, for one. Number two, if, you're, if your garment that you're wearing is... So, for example, when the thief comes and you have to show up at the pearly gate, so to speak. Yeah. Okay? And you show up there and you say, what kind of clothing is that? that well, this is the clothing of feeding the poor. And this is, this is the slacks of going to church every Sunday. And, and these are the socks and shoes. Of, no, no, no. You're not getting in based upon those garments. If he looks at you and says, oh, you look like my son, Jesus Christ. Guess what? That garment works. The fourth beatitude comes from the 19th chapter and the 9th verse of Revelation. And the angel, what's the angel again? Messenger. The messenger said to me, write this. Is it important? Must be. Must be. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow. The marriage supper. Do you like to go to weddings? Mm. Eh, you've had enough of weddings, right? Yeah. Uh, but some weddings you want to go to, right? There are some weddings you wouldn't miss, right? And usually that has to do with the family member, but sometimes because uh, there's going to be a big sit-down dinner and Somebody else is paying for it. Or there's going to be a party afterwards. You know, some, some of the weddings, the receptions, uh, are just such joyous occasions. You know, there's, there's dancing and there's, uh, well, let's just go ahead and say it. There's drinking, you know. Mm -hmm. what, the, the, what, it seems like you've got that wrist really warmed up there. So the, uh, videos, I see what so, they do. So, so uh, it's fun. yeah, it's fun. So, I mean, even, uh, even Jesus was at such uh, uh, wedding uh, parties. In Cana of Galilee is where he did his first uh, uh, miracle, and he provided uh, evidently some pretty good wine for those partiers there that had already had a lot of wine. Uh, so, you know, marriage suppers, this is a special one, though. This is one we don't want to miss. You may not be real keen on, on weddings and such now, but you don't want to miss this one, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited. If you get that invitation, you better respond. You better, you better put it on your calendar. You better get there. Well, I don't know what. Well, messenger, pastor, angel. I don't know what date to put down. Well, then you better be just ready. Right. You just what better be ready. Be ready. Uh, when when it's time to go, you better be ready. And if you're going to be ready, you got to have to be dressed in what kind of garments? In Jesus Christ Himself. And you have. Yeah. These are the true words of God. You are blessed if you are invited to that marriage supper. Revelation 20, verse 6 is the fifth beatitude of Revelation. Not only blessed, but holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, I'm just going to give you a little heads up about the way numbers work in Revelation because numbers play a big role. There's lots of threes and sevens and tens and twelves and thousands, and there's other numbers that are used as well. Uh, a lot of numbers that express a half a year or a full year or three years, years uh, or three and a half years. Um, so these, these numbers are used a lot, and when a thousand is used... A thousand is used to mean a pretty long time or a pretty big amount, but not so large that you couldn't count it out. Okay. Not forever. So yes. Yeah, so for example, um, 
Could you count the number of ceiling tiles that are in the fellowship hall? No. Well, you could. You absolutely could. Would you want to do it? No. No, you wouldn't. And there's not even a thousand down here, is it? Okay. Okay? There's not a thousand down here. My but but you could look up at it and you could go, golly, there must be a thousand tiles up there. Okay? Now, you don't mean that there's one thousand tiles up there. When you say, oh, a thousand look at that there. crowd of people at Bicentennial Park for the, the Red Line concert. Look at that crowd. But what? There must be a thousand people there. Well, you don't know how many people are there. Why? Because you didn't count them. What you mean by that is that there's a lot. And that you could count them. You could number it. It wouldn't take forever. You could count it out. Now, the, the numerological language in Revelation is not so obscure that we can't understand it when we think about it. But the problem is, when it says... A thousand years, some people, because they don't know how to read, have assigned to that there's going to be a time when there's going to be exactly a thousand years, and it, that's not what it's talking no. about at all. It's outside the, the way the language in this letter works. My husband always has, oh, said it many times God's time is not like our time. Right? Yeah, that's true. That's exactly true. Uh, a, a year to the Lord is like a thousand, a thousand. years, and a thousand years is like a day. So, it, you're exactly right. But what this means, specifically, in kind of uh, symbolic language or, or poetic language, is it will reign with him for a thousand years. Well, that means it's a long, long time. Okay? <clears throat> well, how long are we going to reign with him? Man, I'll bet you we reign with him for a thousand years. Well, you understand exactly what that means when I put the right inflection not, yeah. in the tone of my voice. Okay? Blessed are such ones. The sixth beatitude is Revelation 22, verse 7. And behold, I am coming when? Soon. 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 Very Blessed good. is the one, knowing that, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Well, that's just kind of a repetition of half of the first beatitude, which says, blessed are those who hear and who keep what's written in the prophecy of the book. So blessed is the one who keeps the prophecy. Now what does it mean to keep? Remember. It means it to heart. hear it and to obey it. Okay? The seventh and the last beatitude in Revelation comes from the 14th verse of the last chapter. How many chapters in Revelation? A lot. 22. 22. No, there's not a thousand. There's, there's 22. We can count to 22 quickly. We don't mind. So... Blessed are those who wash their robes. Um, I read a, a statement the other day that I met was guest, meant to uh, conserve water and resources. It was talking about how often we need to wash our clothing. So you, you wash your, your slacks uh, once every couple of weeks, this says. In other words, you can wear them every day for a couple of weeks. And your shirt... Uh, every couple of days. You can wear a shirt for a couple of days. And uh, your underwear and your socks, two days, it says. I'm thinking, Whoa. I don't want to live in this guy's house or whoever wrote this thing. Um, blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, are they talking about uh, uh, washing uh, every couple of days or every couple of weeks? Or are they talking about washing with, uh, with uh, detergent and water? That's not at all. They're talking about washing their robes in what? In Jesus, in, uh... You're getting close. In the letter to Sardis, I believe, which is in chapter 3. It says in chapter 3, verse 4, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. That doesn't sound very pretty, does it? Uh, got dirty garments, dirty robes. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. But what is it that we wash our garments in? Elsewhere in the letters, it says that our garments are made white by washing them in the blood of the Lamb. Now, if you literally washed your white robe, if you took the white uh, robe that I wear on Sunday mornings and, and you washed it in blood, what color would it be? Brown. 
Brand new. Even after you rinsed it out, it'd be oh, a, a pretty deep color. pink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but this is implying that by washing your robe in the blood of the lamb, it will be pure white. So, so how dare we think that a thousand means the number after yeah. 999? Obviously, when you wash a robe in blood, it doesn't become white. Obviously, this is, this, is, this is talking in symbols. But what? But, uh, word, one word, word, because you have to soil robes are sins, I think. Yes, of course, of um, course. And so if you're going to get rid of that sin. sinful soiling, mm -hmm. what are you going to wash it with? Water? No, with Christ. With yeah, the with the blood of Christ. Christ. That's exactly That's right. right. So, what happens when you so wash your robes? You will be blessed because washed with the blood of Christ means that you will be able to walk with your God in heaven. There was an ancient idea uh, that you walk with your God in his realm, which we think of as heaven, in white robes. This is picked up upon in, in Revelation. We're going to talk about it in weeks to come. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that you'll be walking with your God in white, in his realm, in heaven. Because only in such a purely clean robe will you even have the right to the tree of life. Now the tree of life will give you what? If you eat from the tree of life, what will happen? You will live. How long? However You'll long live. You know, you won't, it's not a matter of how long. It's a matter of you won't die. Okay? Oh, okay. We and, can't get past that. Yes. We are preoccupied with death. We certainly are. But if you eat of the tree of life, death is not an issue anymore. Because you're alive. And if you wash your robes, in the blood of the Lamb, so that they are pure, white, you have the right to enter the city by the gates. Well, what city is it talking about? City of God. And what is that city of God also called in Revelation? This was one of the epistle readings uh, a few weeks ago on Sunday morning. And I looked, and behold, coming down from heaven from God was the new Jerusalem, the city of God. That's right. You have the right to enter the gates of that city only when your robe is pure white. And the only way it can be pure white is if it's washed in the blood of, of the Christ. Christ. That Bleach. means that you believe. Yes, that's exactly right. That's what it means. It doesn't have anything to do with your good deeds or anything. It means that you believe. In Jesus Christ. Well, I can't believe that my robe would be washed pure white by dipping it and scrubbing it in blood. Well, blessed are you if you believe. I believe. <laughs> All right? See, yeah. So those are the seven Beatitudes, and they can kind of uh, form for you a, a kind of background by which we will enter now uh, this coming Wednesday and the Wednesdays to follow for probably about a year, as I said before. Uh, all the words of these 22 chapters, which we will read as we go through. Um, these are the first three verses that we have read today, as well as these... Uh, other ones from the Beatitudes. And I think this gives us a kind of good introduction to the book. Uh, uh, yeah.